Hello grade 12 psychology class. Welcome back to another lecture. As you can see, lesson four here, types of studies. We kind of talked about all of these key points a little bit last time. We're going to get a little bit more in detail. Again, uh, you can write these as point form if that works best for you. Uh, pause the beginning or the end, but make sure uh, that you have the information and if you have any questions about what's important or not important feel free uh, to let me know I am always here to help you out uh, so let's go right into it so we're gonna talk about goals first so the goals of research so the goals of research are to describe behavior to explain its causes and uh, to predict the circumstances under which certain behaviors may occur occur again uh, and then in some circumstances to control it. So we use these different methods to find out as much information as we can about a certain topic, certain behavior, a certain phenomenon to accomplish these goals. And again, these goals, what we want to get done depends on um, our philosophy of psychology, which we talked about a little bit in lesson two, the different uh, ideas behind it, the drivers behind it. Uh, so those are the goals and we're going to talk about the different ways that we can get there. So a naturalistic observation. Researchers need to know, need to know how people and animals behave naturally when they are not conscious of being observed during an experiment. If you're being watched, you will automatically behave just a little bit differently than if you're, you're not. It's uh, a very common um, uh, phenomenon that uh, you know, even you have probably noticed. So the cardinal rule of a naturalistic observation is to avoid disturbing the people or animals you are studying by concealing yourself or by acting as unobtrusively as possible. Otherwise, you may observe a performance. Uh, otherwise, you may uh, observe a performance produced because of the researcher's presence. Uh, so if uh, the subject knows that someone is watching them, it's very common for them to act differently. Uh, that is why, um, you know, in all the cop shows, they have people standing behind that mirror because if you can see the people there watching you, you're gonna act differently than if you can't. Uh, it's just a little thing that is very, very common. So the key is that they don't know that you're there. A case study, and that's key point two, uh, a case study is an intensive study of a person or a group. Most case studies combine long-term observations with diaries, tests, interviews. They go in depth in this one group or one person, possibly will be a family. And that is um, what Sigmund Freud's main research tool was. They can be a powerful research tool. Sigmund Freud's theory of personality development was based on case studies of his patients. Now. You might say his patients aren't representative of the greater population. Uh, that would be an argument that you can absolutely make. Um, but he was uh, sure of his theory, and he based it off of a lot of different, very deep, in-depth uh, interviews and uh, research case studies of people, uh, individuals. So that was the way that he did his research. By itself, like one case study is a little bit suspect, however. A case uh, study does not or, uh, prove or disprove anything. The results cannot be generalized to anyone. The researchers' conclusions may be sus. Uh, case studies, though, prov uh, case studies provide a wealth of descriptive material that may generate new hypotheses uh, that researchers can then test under controlled conditions with comparison groups. So essentially, if you go in depth into a case study and you find something out, maybe that's something you wanna to study to find out if it is, applies to many different people or all the different groups. So then you would come up with an experiment to test that. So case studies often launch um, larger studies or cross-sectional studies or longitudinal studies that we're going to talk about. That's key point th four and five. Uh, the most practical and most common way to gather information is by a survey. So a survey uh, gathers data on attitudes, beliefs, experiences, and you can get a large number of people uh, through surveys, which is very, very helpful. 
A survey may consist of interviews, questionnaires, or a combination of the two, uh, or even mail-outs or video conferences. Or, you know, whatever needs to be done to get the information to ask those questions, uh, that is what you do. Um, interviews allow a researcher to observe the participant and to modify the questions if the participant seems confused by them, which is a really common thing. If the questions are written down, they may seem clear to me, but they're not clear to you. I think that happens um, regularly in school where, you know, it's very clear to a teacher what they want and it's not clear to a student. And I don't think it's anyone's fault. It's just a little bit of a miscommunication. So if you are doing it in person or if the individual is there, you can ask that question. You can read off their face if they're confused. Uh, you can rephrase the question. Uh, and you can kind of observe their body language as well, and that can be information for your study. So interviews are the best way to do a survey, but there's lots and lots of different ways just to make some questions and give them out like that. On the other hand, a questionnaire takes less time to administer and the results are more uniform because everyone answers the exact same question. So that's why a paper copy is good and no one gets any special treatment no one is given more clarification. The questions are all the same. They read them, they answer them, and that's how it is. They also reduce the possibility that researchers will influence a participant by unconsciously frowning at an answer uh, that they don't like. So this is very common for the subject to pick up on the body language of the interviewer. Uh, in interviews, there's always a danger that the participant will give misleading answers in order to help themselves gain approval. So it's also very common that Individuals, you know, if, if there's a question about bad behavior, they don't want to say that, uh, you know, yeah, I've done these things and I know that they're bad. They will just lie and they will say that they, um, you know, didn't do them to gain approval. But if you give them a questionnaire or a piece of paper to answer on that's anonymous, uh, they will be able to more often, you know, express themselves or, you know, write down the truth which is always what you want in a psychology survey. A longitudinal study, key point four. So when we conduct longitudinal studies, a psychologist studies the same group of people or person at regular intervals over a period of years. It's key that it's years in a longitudinal study to determine whether their behavior uh, and or feelings have changed. And if they have changed, how have they changed? After you find out how they've changed, you can to try to determine why they've changed. These are very time consuming, very costly studies. They're very precarious. Um, participants often disappear mid study. So like they move and they don't tell you or they just don't want to do this anymore and they just stop coming or their circumstances change or they go to jail or they go to the hospital, they get in the hospital. Uh, participants just you know, end up disappearing mid-study over longitudinal studies. They are, however, an ideal way to examine consistencies and inconsistencies in behavior over time. Uh, they are, you know, if you can get a longitudinal study for someone that is having trouble, um, you know, either mentally or with learning, um, they can often be very, very beneficial as you can, like, work to change that behavior as you go, as you learn more. And a cross-sectional study. So in a cross-sectional study, psychologists organize individuals into groups on the basis of age. This is generally age, most of the time it is. Then these groups are randomly sampled and the members of each group are surveyed, tested, or observed simultaneously. So you do the experiment on each of these age groups and you find out the results, see if they're different. Now you wanna make sure that you're actually studying that thing and not you know, just um, you know, intelligence or, so, or something else. So uh, you want to carefully control these studies, but cross-sectional studies divide individuals into groups. Uh, these are less expensive than longitudinal studies and reduce the amount of time necessary for the studies, um, but it's really not as reliable as a long, longitudinal study because you don't get as information about one person over that amount of time. These are all different people. In 1995, research, researchers conducted a cross-sectional study in which they showed three, four, uh, six, and seven-year-olds a picture of serious-looking woman. The psychologists then asked the participants what they thought the woman was thinking about. 
The psychologist found that the older children seem to have a clearer picture of mental processes. So you could take four years from three to seven and do this study uh, and find out how this child's uh, mental processes uh, or, or depict, uh, depictions of mental processes became clearer. Or you could just choose students or um, individuals, participants at these ages and see how um, they each perform and just assume that it's due to development. Uh, so it's a different way of looking at it, much cheaper and much more time effective. Your job now is to check out these important terms, uh, define them. If you have any questions, please let me know. Again, these will apply to when we get into our uh, designing our psychology experiment, which I plan on uh, doing this semester. And then do the assignment advantages and disadvantages of different studies. Uh, if you guys have any questions, please let me know. I thank you guys for watching, and I will see you in class.